I love that song. As we come to these ancient words, we recognize that they are no less relevant today than they were when the Lord spoke them. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. It knows us better than we know ourselves because it's written by the God who made us. And so I, I am grateful to speak on the power of those words and not anything I've got. <laughs> we trust in God and His Word. Turn with me please to Micah chapter 7. This is week 9 of our 10-week series in this book. Next week, Lord willing, we'll wrap up. We will also close with a time of prayer like we did our last sermon series. We'll ask the Lord to put into our lives the application of the truths that we've learned. We'll do that next week as we finish up. Today we're in chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And this last chapter of the book is a deeply personal part of the book for Micah the prophet. Remember, he's giving these oracles, prophetic oracles, to God's people, but he's also one of God's people. And so it, it hits home for him, I think, perhaps most powerfully in this chapter. In both parts of this chapter, this week and next week, we'll, we will see Micah the prophet's own internal response to the news that he's delivering. It's almost like in this section we have a soliloquy. Remember that? When you studied Shakespeare in high school, you learned about what a soliloquy, I can't even say it, a soliloquy was. Soliloquies are when the audience is given insight into the mind and heart of one character in particular. Right? They sort of, the rest of the action sort of stops and the character has a moment of internal musings and, and responses and realizations that he or she is going through. Often in those works of literature, soliloquies reflect a turning point or a major decision that that character is making in the midst of extraordinary times. And the book of Micah is also a work of literature. I think we see something like that in this chapter. One of the most famous soliloquies we know about is Hamlet, where he says, to be or not to be, that is the question. At that moment, he's wrestling, he's considering his response to his uncle having killed his dad and taken the throne of Denmark. Some of you haven't thought about this since, you know, 11th grade or something. And you'd prefer I didn't bring it up. <laughs> uh, even better, a better example of this that I thought of as I was reading Micah 7 is from Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, where Jean Valjean, main character, he's released from a French prison where he's done hard labor for 19 years. Uh, five years for stealing just a loaf of bread and then 14 after that for multiple escape attempts. And so he finally gets out of prison and immediately goes back, and steals something, he steals silver from a bishop and he's caught right away. And as a repeat offender, he's heading towards life imprisonment in the harsh conditions of this time in France. And the police find him and they take him back to the bishop. And the bishop, as an act of mercy, acts as if he had given him the silver and says, hey, why didn't you take this other part too? And gives him even more. And after the police leave, the bishop tells Jean Valjean that by this act of mercy, he has purchased his soul for God. In response, Valjean gives an incredible soliloquy, which actually in the film version 2012, Hugh Jackman sings an incredibly gripping scene. Just a few excerpts from that. He says, what have I done? I'm not going to sing it, by the way. <laughs> what have I done? Sweet Jesus, what have I done? Become a thief in the night? Become a dog on the run? And have I fallen so far and as the hour so late that nothing remains but the cry of my hate. Yet why did I allow this man to touch my soul and teach me love? 
He treated me like any other. He gave me his trust. He called me brother. My life he claims for God above. The final part. As I stare into the void, to the whirlpool of my sin, I'll escape now from that world, from the world of Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean is nothing now. Another story must begin. And from that point on, from a moment of extreme desperation, his life has changed. He expresses faith in God. He repents from a life of crime. And he walks the path of an upright man who lives selflessly, And takes care of others in need, as you see through the rest of the story. I think Micah has a similar experience in chapter 7. He's just delivered important, very important messages from the Lord himself. God, the shepherd of his people. These messages have come to the nation of Israel. And they were both messages of judgment and messages of hope. Really, they're messages of hope in the midst of judgment. Really, as Micah delivers these... He feels the emotional weight of what is going on in the lives of his people. And at a critical moment for Micah, in a moment of extreme desperation, he too expresses his faith in God. He chooses to walk a path of an upright life. And he gives us an example of trusting the Lord above all others. This section reflects his own internal wrestlings and reflections. Chapter 7. How sad for me, for I am like one who, when the summer fruit has been gathered after the gleaning of the grape harvest, finds no grape cluster to eat, no early fig which I crave. Faithful people have vanished from the land. There is no one upright among the people. All of them wait in ambush to shed blood. They hunt each other with a net. Both hands are good at accomplishing evil. The official and the judge demand a bribe. When the powerful man communicates his evil desire, they plot it together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is worse than a hedge of thorns. The day of your watchman, the day of your punishment is coming. At this time, their panic is here. Do not rely on a friend. Don't trust in a close companion. Seal your mouth from the woman who lies in your arms. Surely a son considers his father a fool. A daughter opposes her mother, and a daughter-in-law is against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Listen, but I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I think you can see that the whole passage builds to verse 7. Builds to that climactic, powerful declaration of faith in the Lord. But we can't start there. We've got to start back near the beginning with Micah's description of the people of the land. He begins emotionally distraught, grieving at the sinful state of his people. Verse 2, he says, faithful people have vanished from the land. He says, there's nobody that's upright. They, they, they premeditate violence toward one another. They're waiting in ambush to shed blood. We've talked about repeated sins that, that, that really all the prophetic books denounce. The three sins starting with I, immorality, injustice, and idolatry. We see immorality here, attacking others. That's immoral, and it's unjust. So they're acting in this way. And I think we've felt the impact of that in our city lately. With deeply tragic and frightening stories about wicked and senseless and gratuitous violence. People waiting in ambush to shed blood. And so, though we are about 2,700 years from Micah in terms of time, time elapsed, this sort of situation remains. This is not foreign to us. Verse 3 says, both hands are good at accomplishing evil. They, humanity has gotten good skilled at doing evil things. They're creative about it, wicked in new ways, finding more and and more twisted ways to sin. He said there are bribes. There are bribes demanded by leaders, the official and the judge, people who claim to stand for justice and righteousness. The stand up for what's right are the ones deeply sinning. I read a story uh, late last year from World Magazine 
In 2020, it says, Las Vegas businessman Donald Kirk Hartle gave media interviews questioning the integrity of Nevada's presidential election after claiming someone submitted a fraudulent mail-in ballot on behalf of his deceased wife. So he's coming forward, you know, claiming to be the one standing for, you know, fair elections and saying somebody voted on behalf, you know, claimed to be my wife who's passed away. The article says maybe he shouldn't have publicized the case. A year later, on November 15th, Hartle himself agreed to a plea deal for voter fraud, admitting he had been the one to cast the ballot for his wife. According to the deal, Hartle will accept a $2,000 fine and probation. At the time, Hartle had used his experience to cast doubt on Nevada's election results. He had said, that is pretty sickening to me, to be honest with you. He told a news station that. Here's this guy claiming to stand up for what's right, and he's the one perpetrating it. In Micah's case, bribes were widespread in the justice system. We've certainly heard of similar examples today. Micah also says in verse 3 that the powerful among his people are plotting. They're spending time with premeditation and intentionality to do evil, right? When the powerful man communicates his evil desire, they plot it together. Then he says in verse 4, the best of them. It's not just the the judge who's seeking a bribe or or the most wicked. He said, the best of them is like a briar. The most upright is worse than a hedge of thorns. He says, so the best people among his nation will cut you like a briar. The most upright will tear you like a hedge of thorns. He says, you can't rely on anyone. And that's when he says, the day of your watching, the day of your punishment is coming. Panic is here. The day of punishment and judgment not only on Israel, but on all men, is coming. And so I think Micah's words here are a reminder that all of us need the gospel. (laughs) That's point one. Remember that all of us need the gospel. He says that this kind of behavior even comes from the best among them. This made me think back to our sermon series going through the book of Genesis. You know, we rightly see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as, you know, heroes of our faith. But we talked multiple times about Abraham lying about his wife, about who his wife was. We talked about Abraham and Sarah treating Hagar, their slave, horribly. We saw Isaac also follow in his father's footsteps and not act with integrity and lie about also who his wife was. We saw Jacob, whose name literally means deceiver. These are the the three patriarchs of Israel, and we see even the best among them, the men who are named in Hebrews 11 amongst the hall of faith. We see that they sometimes too could be like briars and thorns to others. What about David? David, you know, is the king, you know, the, the preeminent king amongst ancient Israel. He inaugurates the golden age of ancient Israel, and yet, you know, he was guilty of murder and adultery and pride. Pride that led to a pestilence across the land. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, there is certainly no one righteous on the earth who does good and never sins. (laughs) There's nobody that fits in that category. Not even our great heroes of the faith. And this should be a reminder to us when we read a passage like Micah 7. Because it's sometimes easy to look at the horrifying sins of others, especially some of those we see in ancient Israel, that seem so far removed from our time, so far removed from our experience. It's easy for us to look at them and come away with a sense of arrogance or superiority. I think it's even easier to look at the disciples in the Gospels, and Peter's constantly putting his foot in his mouth. They're fighting with each other over who's going to be the greatest amongst the disciples. We look at that, we look at uh, the whole lot of them not understanding Jesus' true mission until even after his resurrection, actually, even all the way to the point of the Holy Spirit coming. We look at them falling asleep. When Jesus tells them to stay awake and pray, we see them betraying Jesus or denying Jesus. And we can so easily think, man, what is wrong with those guys? (laughs) 
Why don't they get it? Can't they get their act together? And I think in all of those cases, Scripture would call us to look in the mirror first. To look inward first. Just like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we lie and deceive sometimes. Just like the disciples, our spirits are willing, but our flesh is weak. We are all in need of Jesus' redemption and patience and mercy and grace. None of us can be good enough to go to heaven or to live forever or to be in God's presence. Listen to Psalm 14, 1 through 3. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. Paul quotes that in Romans 3. Verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven on the human race, picture this, to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. That includes me. That includes all of us. Much of the pattern of sin, by the way, that Micah describes in chapter 7 fits with the sins that the book of Proverbs says God hates. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. I think I've been guilty. In fact, I know I've been guilty of at least four of those. Arrogant eyes, telling lies, a heart that plots wickedness sometimes, stirring up trouble between others. Paul, in his letters, consistently takes his readers back to the gospel. And I hope you don't ever get tired of that. <laughs> Because I think it's my job to constantly take us back there. It's not just that we're saved one day and then the rest of our lives we're coasting until we get to heaven. It's not just that the gospel gets us into heaven and it doesn't do anything between our salvation and heaven. The message of the gospel is also what sanctifies us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power at work within us to walk in righteousness. The Holy Spirit who's come into you through the gospel and dwells you is the one who empowers the Christian life, the rest of the Christian life. Paul says in Galatians, why would you think that you you, you couldn't start the Christian life on your own, but you could run the rest of it on your own? That's not, if it starts with the work of the Spirit, the rest of it is definitely not going to be a work of the flesh. If I can't get off the starting line of the Christian race on my own strength, I'm definitely not going to be able to run all the other steps. (laughs) It's still coming back to the power of God through the gospel, through the finished work of Jesus. We all need the gospel. And Micah points us here to the mercy of God in rescuing us, even though we have been unfaithful. We have been rebellious. And I think this truth should lead to at least three results in our lives. Number one is worship. That we praise the God who not only made us, but who chose in His grace to save us when we didn't deserve that. And so we sing, we pray, we gather. But of course, worship is not just what we sing. It's not just music. It's not just the fruit of our lips. It's the fruit of our lives. Romans 12 says that we offer him the sacrifice of obedience. That is worship, a living sacrifice presented to him that we follow in Jesus' footsteps, learning his teaching, obeying him. The second result is humility. When we remember the gospel, it reminds us (laughs) where we came from. It reminds us that we were no better off than anyone else in this world. And that should squelch pride. As we remember our state before a completely holy and infinite and omnipotent God, that should lead to humility. Humility that impacts the way we talk to others and treat others. 
because we recognize where we stand before God and what he's called us to do and how we're supposed to relate to them. And then third, this result this should result in evangelism. When we remember the gospel, remember that we all need the gospel, it should cause us to remember there are lots of people around us who don't yet know it. Lots of people for whom it has not been planted in their hearts and grown into the seed of eternal life and forgiveness and salvation. And he sent us to them. Just imagine what it would be like if no one had come and told you about Christ and realized that's the situation for millions of people all around us. And, and billions throughout the world. He's called us and sent us. We all desperately need the gospel. But there's something else I want you to see in Micah's deeply personal lament for the state of his nation. Go back to verse 1. How sad for me. For I am like one who, when the summer fruit has been gathered after the gleaning of the grape harvest, finds no grape cluster to eat, no early fig, which I crave. And so picture a man thirsty in the desert, crawling across the desert, trying to find some water. And he comes over a hill and he looks down and there's, there's, he sees an oasis with palm trees and springs. And so he finds the strength to crawl a little further. And as he gets closer, it's a mirage and it's gone. What he wanted most of all, what he needed most of all, has slipped through his fingers What he needs most of all has escaped him. That's how Micah feels about the state of his nation, the state of his people. He gives the analogy of a harvest. There's been a whole process leading up to this harvest of planting, of watering. I'm sorry, yeah, of sowing and watering and then harvesting. And then yet he goes to eat and it's gone. Right? The summer fruit has been gathered. It's even been brought in but then I can't find it. It slips away. He doesn't explain why. It's just an analogy. But think about it. When you do all of those things, planting, watering, harvesting, the natural and normal result is that you enjoy the fruit of your labors, right? You enjoy the harvest. It should have resulted in satisfaction, but it has slipped through his fingers. I think the analogy here is this. God has invested so much in his people he should have been able to find the fruit of faithfulness and righteousness i don't have time to go through this text but you can write down isaiah 5 as a really important cross reference here where isaiah sings a song of the lord about his vineyard and how he had done everything necessary planting the vineyard, providing a watchtower to keep it safe, you know, getting all the weeds out, all those kind of things, planted a, uh, uh, the fruit or the seeds and came back to harvest and he had no, no fruit from it. He says he's going he's gonna to wipe it clean and start over. And then Jesus actually brings up that passage in the New Testament and relates it to the religious leadership of Israel and how they're leading people away from God and are not bearing fruit for the Lord. It's the same analogy I think that Mike is giving us here. Faithfulness and righteousness among the people of God should be what Micah the prophet finds. It should be what the Lord finds when he looks at our lives because of how much he's done for us in Christ. I think in, in Micah's terms, what had God done that should have brought about a harvest of faithfulness and righteousness? God had called Israel. He had chosen them. Abraham came out of a background of idolatry and God called him into relationship with himself and God rescued these people from slavery. He had given them every opportunity and blessing and help to keep them on the right path. He had given them his word, his prophets, the judges and the book of judges. He had given them priests. They had the temple where they could come and worship God. They had the law of God. They were living in the promised land. They had the history of God's faithfulness among their ancestors. They had been given so much grace and revelation of God revealing himself to them. So much redemption and blessing. And yet, faithful people have vanished from the land. Micah's not saying he's perfect. As I just said, we all need the gospel. He still needs redemption too. But as one who is proclaiming God's word and trying to follow the Lord, Micah feels so alone. How sad for me, he says. 
Faithful people have vanished. He craves fellowship and support and fellow travelers on the path of walking with God. And he's expressing that honestly to God. That's a good thing in prayer. I don't, I don't think he sins in expressing this to the Lord. But I do think that the rest of the book reminds us that in Christ we are never alone. That's our second point. Know this, that in Christ you are never alone. There's an important Old Testament word that I've mentioned to you already multiple times in this study of Micah. That word is the remnant. It appears five times in Micah, a bunch of times in other prophetic books. It's sort of spread a few places throughout the book of Micah. That word remnant refers to the group of people whom the Lord rescues in the midst of judgment and tragedy. It refers to the people who, because of his gracious rescue, will walk with him faithfully. You can flip back. Chapter 4, verse 7. I, God says, will make the lame into a remnant. Those far removed into a strong nation. Then the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time on and forever. Next chapter, chapter 5, verse 7. Then the remnant of Jacob will be among many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which do not wait for anyone or linger for mankind. The next verse is another instance. Then the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many peoples, like a lion among animals of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, which tramples and tears as it passes through, and there is no one to rescue them. But if you go back to chapter 7, which we're looking at today, and scan down to the section below our text. This is what I'll preach on next week, but I want you to see this. Verse 18 of chapter 7. Who is a God like you? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. Forgiving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance. There are others. He's setting aside to himself. He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. Micah felt alone. Faithful people have vanished from the land, he says. But first of all, God himself had not abandoned him, right? And second, there was a remnant of God's inheritance. That's what verse 18 says. Those whom God had set apart to himself. Those whom he had graciously forgiven and rescued. Micah was not alone. And neither are you. He felt that way. And sometimes you and I do too. And I think we should say that to God in prayer. I think it was a good thing that he poured this out to the Lord. But scripture shows us that in Christ we are never alone. A couple of times recently I've mentioned Elijah's experience in 1 Kings 19. And I think it's relevant here again because Uh, Micah, after his victory against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he goes all the way into the wilderness to Mount Sinai. And what does God say to him there? They actually have the conversation twice. The Lord says, Elijah, what are you doing here? (laughs) And Elijah says, I've been zealous for you. But the nation of Israel has abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And now they're coming after me. I alone am left. And then we we know that uh, that God interacts with him in different ways. And then finally, actually the Lord's not in the other ways that he interacts with him or that that Elijah experiences. But then the Lord is in the still small voice. But God asks him a second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats that same thing and says, I alone am left. And when the Lord... (laughs) finishes this conversation he says a lot of things to Elijah but one of the things he says is I have reserved for myself 7,000 people who have not bowed the knee to Baal you're not alone there's others who are walking faithfully with me think about David when Saul was chasing him Saul the king bringing a whole army to bear, attacking David. When David had been faithful to Saul. He's literally, twice he has to go and hide amongst the Philistines in the city of Gath, which is where Goliath is from. That must have been awkward. (laughs) 
And yet, in the midst of that, David writes this psalm, Psalm 142. And the title at the top, which is part of the original, is important because it gives us the context. A masquil of David, that's a, a type of poem. When he was in the cave, a prayer. He's in the cave hiding from Saul. I cry aloud to the Lord. I plead aloud to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. I reveal my trouble to him. Although my spirit is weak within me, you know my way. I'm not, you're there with me. Along this path I travel, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. No one stands up for me. See what I mean? He just feels alone. There is no refuge for me. No one cares about me. He's having to go and live amongst his enemies instead of with his people. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my shelter, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am very weak. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. And we know he did that. The Lord answered that prayer. Free me from prison so that I can praise your name. The righteous will gather around me because you deal generously with me. Jesus, I think, in the Garden of Gethsemane felt this. As I mentioned earlier, the disciples couldn't even stay awake to pray with him. And that the Lord was with them, the Father and the Spirit were with him. In Luke, we see that the Father sends an angel to strengthen him. You can express to God when you feel alone. And you can find family and help and support and strength in his church. I heard a, a very powerful story of this last year uh, at the Tennessee Baptist State Convention. Our, our president in the Tennessee Baptist Convention last year was Pastor Bruce Chesser, and he told this story. He said that 40 years ago, he heard a testimony he never forgot. Obviously, it's stuck in his mind for 40 years. At a pastor's conference, there was a woman and a young man who both stood up to share a testimony. The young man was in his 20s or so, and the woman was in her 60s. The man told a story about a time where he had been at a desperate point. He was really young. He had lost his job. He had a drug problem. He had relationship problems. He was in trouble with the law. And it had gotten so bad that this young man had decided to take his own life. He just come to that conclusion. And he decided to do it the next day. So he went to bed, and wakes up the next morning. But first he decides to drive across town to the community where he grew up. Just feeling nostalgic or something. And so he decides to walk through his boyhood neighborhood and see the places, you know, his old school and places he used to play and sort of take it all in. And then he was planning on following through on his decision. He passed a church in the process of that walk that he had totally forgotten about. And, and as he's there gradually memories come back and he remembered that he had actually gone to this church as a, as a kid years and years prior and, and it actually brought back happy memories from going there and going to Sunday school and he hadn't thought about it but he realized today's Sunday so they're having church and he decided to walk in and he finds his way to the sanctuary and he sits down and after a while he realizes that it's between Sunday school and service. So people are kind of milling around, the service isn't going on. And he starts looking down and he, he sees a doorway that goes into a hall and he, he remembers going through that door and remembers that he used to walk down a certain hall and go into his Sunday school room. And so he just kind of starts wandering that way. He remembers the room where he used to color and hear Bible lessons and memories are just coming back. He walks down the hall and he recognizes the door. He peeked into the room and he's, he sees a lady standing there. And it was the same lady who used to stand in that room when he was a little boy. Some of you have served here that long and that faithfully. <laughs> the woman that was at the conference standing next to him telling the story, as he's telling the story, she began to speak and she said, that was me in the room. So she had finished Sunday school that day and every, all the kids had left. She's cleaning up. She's getting ready to go to choir. Does that sound familiar? Anybody relate? <laughs> and at first when she sees this man standing in the doorway, she was kind of startled. 
And she ended up thinking that he had come to pick up his child, and she's like, well, their kids are already gone, and he just stared at her. Finally, he said, Miss Lewis, do you remember me? But of course, you think about the passage of time. And he had changed appearances a lot more than she had. But she could tell by the look on his face that something was going on in his heart. That he was in turmoil. I love this part. She prayed silently, Lord, help me remember his name. He's about ready to turn around and leave because no one knew him. He felt like no one would miss him if he was gone. She walks over to him, stops, and reaches out, and <laughs> sort of stares into his face and grabs him by the shoulders. It says, Richard, is that you? And, and he said at the conference, he said, or she said, excuse me, that when she said that he fell into her arms like a kid, sobbing. And he found a pastor, and he shared what he was struggling with, and talked to some other folks, and his life was changed. He confessed faith in Christ, and the Lord rescued him. And this young man, Richard, said to that pastor's conference, it all happened because somebody cared. And it made me think back to, you know, ladies in, in the Sunday school class when I was a kid, Elizabeth Corp and Esther Haas, who are both with the Lord now, one of them was a widow at that time, and they poured into me. And many of you could give examples like that. People who cared and took the time. Everybody hurts. Lots of people feel alone. Though we seem to be more connected than ever before, it's, it's not really that, is it? It's superficial. People are alone and they need to feel the love of Jesus through us. Because Jesus is with us. In Christ, we're not alone. And he often shows us that through one another. We experience the presence of Christ through each other. You remember when Micah was lamenting the state of affairs in Israel? In verse 5 and 6, he explains how extreme it was. He feels alone, and he looks around and even says, Do not rely on a friend. Don't trust in a close companion. Seal your mouth from the woman who lies in your arms. Surely a son considers his father a fool. A daughter opposes her mother, and a daughter-in-law is against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. I don't think Micah is telling us here to not have close friends. I mean, I just gave a sermon point about <laughs> us feeling loved in the church and, and reaching out to one another, and that we're never alone. I don't think he's telling us not to have trust and build trust in our marriages. I think he's doing two things. Number one, he's describing the deep, and far-reaching effects of sin on even the most intimate relationships. The earthly conflict that results when we turn away from the Lord. Israel was desperately wicked in this period, and it's affecting everything in their lives. Second, he's showing us, all of us, that there is only one who will never let us down. I've mentioned from another text recently that no one, not even our spouses, should be asked to carry the burden of our ultimate happiness or fulfillment. Only God can be our ultimate hope. So our last point is that though all others fail you, trust the Lord. Though all others fail you, trust the Lord. You have to, to get this strong declaration of faith in verse 7. But I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I think he gives this idea of trusting the Lord in, in three different ways, from three different angles. First, just walk through the parts of the verse. I will look to the Lord. Look to God. He's your salvation. That's not a, that's not a physical look with your eyes. We're talking about what's going on in the heart. So when something bad happens or when you're going through difficulty, what happens in your mind? Where does your heart go? 
That's where you're looking. God alone is your salvation. Discipline your heart. Teach your heart through, through God's truth to look to God alone. To not look to money or your own resources or the government or your education or experience or anything or anyone else, but to trust in His grace and rescue alone. Second part of the verse, he says, I will wait for the God of my salvation. We wait on Him with patience. One of my uh, favorite worship songs is called Wait on the Lord. It's based on Psalm 27, which, like Micah in verse 7, tells us to wait on God. There's this aspect of not only of faith, but of patience, right? Trusting not just God's plan, but His timing for that plan. That's, that's where it gets really hard. <laughs> All right, it's one thing for me to say, I trust the Lord. It's another for me to say, it doesn't have to happen right now. <laughs> right? That's what waiting on the Lord conveys. Trust and patience, depending on his plan and his timing for that plan. So here's Psalm 27 that that song I mentioned is based on, just a few verses from it. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. For he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Even if my father and mother abandon me, sounds like Micah here, the Lord cares for me. Wait for the Lord, or some translations say, wait on the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. In this worship song, it's, it's called Wait on the Lord. The, this, they're singing the verses, and uh, there's this refrain as they sing sections from the scripture where there's this, it always sounds to me like this, this kind of old guy in the background. It's kind of bluesy. And after almost every line, he just goes, wait on the Lord. Like he, he's down in his soul. He does a lot better than me. But it's, it, just, it just gives this sense of someone who's been through it. You know? Been through suffering and been through difficulty and knows that God is faithful by experience. That's what waiting on the Lord means. It's trusting Him and being patient for his timing third part of the verse verse 7 my god will hear me we trust that he will hear and act micah's confidence in god hearing his prayers is also confidence that god will act otherwise you wouldn't pray it trust that god is listening to you and working even when you don't see it or don't understand it the Lord knows your situation better than you do. He's already working in you and around you if you're his child. He's bringing good out of whatever thing you may face. Let go of control. We never had it anyway. <laughs> Let go of anxiety. Let go of fear. Trust the Lord's tender love and care. He is your good shepherd he knows what is best for his sheep and he has a glorious plan for us that is good for us far beyond our wildest dreams let's pray father i thank you that we can see into micah's heart and see his pain and his grief but also see a declaration of faith God, I thank you for the reminder that all of us need your gospel. May we never forget that. May we never take for granted your grace and kindness to us. God, I thank you that in Christ we are never alone. Maybe, may we always be aware of that, that you are with your people and that you've brought us. When we're saved, we're brought into a community of faith, a family, as we share a heavenly father. God, I ask that you would help us to trust you because no one else is always faithful like you are. You never let us down. We look to you for salvation. We wait on your timing. We know that you will hear and act. God, give us hope and may others see that hope and come to know you as well through us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.